Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace or pursue your present course and face obliteration. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Like, is this uh, the official first episode, I guess? This is it. All right. So, welcome to the first episode of the show, everybody. This is Victor. And with me is uh, Mark. Mark. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your uh, name thunder there, Mark. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Um, so, for this episode, we are going to be talking about Ted Kaczynski's Unabomber Manifesto. Exactly, industrial society and its future, as he titled it, and uh, you know, got. I think the Unabomber Manifesto is kind of the uh, like derogatory term given to it. <laughs> so. Is that what they called it after the fact? Because when I yeah. downloaded it, I downloaded like the only title I have on mine. It just says Unabomber Manifesto. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so he, he titled it. So I guess it, it depends on how you downloaded it because on mine it just says unabomber manifesto it gives a table of contents it still has all the paragraph like everything's numbered by paragraph right yeah right but on mine it does not say the industrial revolution in it. oh wow okay yeah so the proper so, title is as he submitted it's probably it probably a bootleg to, uh... version but <laughs> So, yeah, his title, Industrial Society and Its Future, otherwise known as the Unabomber Manifesto. So, and. Now, what was your knowledge of the manifesto and the man in general going into this? So, I've read it once. Um, before I read it, I. And, you know, I just kind of say this about it. Our, I think our discussion about it, so most of the analysis, if you go onto YouTube, if you type in Unabomber Manifesto, Ted Kaczynski, most of the analysis you get is, um, it's from like a true crime kind of perspective, whereas, you know, right. this is a terrorist and this is, here's the, the tale, the harrowing tale of the FBI's hunt to find him. Um, and before, you know, before I read it, I, mean, I kind of knew that angle of it. Um, now I think we're going to get, I mean, our, our discussion is going to be focused on the content of the book, the content that he wanted to get out to the world. But yeah, when you asked like, what did, you know, what did I know of it before I read it? I kind of knew that true crime angle. You know, he was a terrorist. I didn't know much else about him. I knew that he was referenced in these political circles and that he was, right. um, you know, critical of, of technology, had some kind of a, of a critique of, of technology. But beyond that, I, you know, Beyond like what you'd see in memes and stuff, I didn't know a whole lot before I read it. How about you? Yeah, it seems like he's he's becoming big again thanks to <laughs> literally anytime you see something new pop up with AI or ChatGPT, it it always now gets associated with a picture of him underneath it. Like yeah, this is yeah, where it's, it's all like going. a meme of his <laughs> his face kind of uh, kind of burned over whatever image. Yeah, I know. There's that, one where they, um, there's some kind of an article where they were saying something like, well, we might be able to get rid of parenting and parents could be replaced. Or no, I think it was children can be replaced with um, like Tamagotchi virtual babies. And then it just has a, a picture of his his mugshot kind of over that. Oh, headline. yeah. Well, every every week there's a new article where it's like, oh, you can now take drugs to to feel good or whatever. You know, it's – and for me, like I had – I haven't had not read a single word of this except you know cuz any time you read about it the first line of the manifesto is probably the most quoted line of like of the entire thing yes where yeah it, and that's it the, says the end. just just so just so people are aware the very first line is the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. So if you have read that line anywhere, that is where this came from. And I had no idea where 
I because I I just thought it may have been in the middle of the book or something, but I'm like, no, that's the very first line. And... Yeah, that's kind of his thesis statement, <laughs> kind of his declaration of war. And, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, let's so let's get into it. Let's. Um, you know, I thought first we'll just kind of discuss the the content of the book a little bit. I, I've got kind of an outline here, and you know, because people meme about the book a lot, but I don't think most people actually know what it was i mean and the book i mean it, it is a manifesto you know this is a guy who actually mailed bombs around the country blowing things up killing people uh, now you could say he did that because he was you know a maniacal psychopath or insane uh, but his reason you know his, his internal reasoning for doing it was you know the content of this book this is his manifesto for doing that well he actually says about halfway through the book or something why he did it and the reason why he did it and he he says is i blew the building up because that was the only way this book would get its attention that i'd want it to get and to that i'm like okay yeah at the time that's probably the only way it would have been spread you do something completely bad and then it gets spread, and that's, and then that like, I don't want to say encourages people to read, but it it creates a curiosity of people to to read it, and that probably wouldn't have happened if he blew up the building. Now I'm sure he could have done some other things to get people's attention, uh, but uh, he does say that's why he did it. Yeah, and I, I have a list here of his bombings. So we can just go over this real quick before we kind of give the bulk of the book. But, yeah, sure um, thing. So, <clears throat> yeah, beginning in yeah, May 1978, I mailed his first bomb out to the uh, Northwestern University. And, it, yeah, it went off, injured somebody, and then there you know a number of bombs for about a decade. Um, and he, you know, he kept – so he's living in his um, – cabin his in the cabin, woods yeah and kind of perfecting his bomb creation techniques over time eventually over i think it was maybe a decade into bombing uh, he's got to the point where now he's building bombs that are actually actually really detonating and killing people um, and he did kill three people I mean, intended to kill many more but um but yeah and so he you know he mailed out i think it, what's what did i say 17 bombs on this list and he apparently you know, would have kept going indefinitely um and it was because of the you know the urgent problem that he felt people you know, needed to uh needed to come around to and you know so I'll, i'm just lay, gonna lay out the first i'll lay out a couple of quick bullet points about the book and then we can kind of just talk about those yeah so sure so he lays out the the book starts out with a really dense section about something that he calls the power process. And it's, it's something I think a lot of people tend to kind of gloss over it, but really that's at the heart of his complaint. And it's something that I didn't get the first time I read the book and really simply the power process. Uh, he talks about this being, drives that human drives that need to be satisfied so feeding yourself uh, creating how you know housing shelter defending yourself he has all, all of these little things that people have to do to survive and the way he sees it humans are only fulfilled I, I guess you know emotionally fulfilled spiritually fulfilled if they're out there with their own, two hands in the wild actually doing this. So you're actually fighting for your own existence. You're getting your own food. You're feeding yourself. And and so he sees that as, first of all, I, I guess crucial to, to human happiness. Um, and the fact that we're not doing that in the modern world, he sees that as a source of a lot of, of unhappiness and chaos and strife and and so that that's kind of like the, that power process that he feels that we're not going through that we're, and we're not feeling satisfied 
people in society are largely not feeling satisfied because they're not fulfilling their, you know, their, their most basic human needs. He sees that's kind of the, the foundation of this. Um, and then he comes up with the, the, um, I'm just pulling up here. Okay. So the, um, surrogate activities, uh, is a concept that he came up with, which is basically, how would you describe the surrogate activities, Mark? Well, you know what? It's it's funny because as we're as you were saying that, I, w- I was just saying that, um, the the as you were you were just saying the, the power process. It's a, it was a little bit tricky your first read through, but this was my first read through. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And and for me, I was I was reading this. It was kind of going a little bit over my head, right? Uh, but the gist of all of this was the this entire power process stuff was humans need goals so and everyone gives themselves some kind of not artificial goals but goals in general right and for some people like let's say like if you if your job was a scientist uh you would have a goal in mind of what you want to do what you want to discover what you want to treat right and these are all things that help make us human and what essentially what 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 we strive for and we strive to have these goals and we need goals in order to basically continue living and be fulfilled yeah and so you know, when it comes to the goals he, he really he kind of has two levels and again yeah this is something i i didn't get this my first read through i feel like he could have yeah you know, bear in mind this is a guy like hacking penning this away you know in the i think by hand in a cabin in the dark in the woods so <laughs> he, yeah he could, yeah. could have stood well, to, to revise it you know if he had gone through an editor i'm sure they would have had him revise this the part about the power process there were a few things about this that i i just found very interesting for one the whole book itself it's pretty short and in general I would say it's very prescient, right? Like you kind of have to read the book knowing that at the time there was no Google. There wasn't really a mainstream internet. There wasn't a a culture where you could just look up something anytime you wanted. You could just buy whatever you wanted online. Like none of that existed. This was just, all of this was kind of on the precipice of that happening but it wasn't there yet. And he could kind of predict it was all headed somewhere there. Yeah. And that's something that really impressed me with this book and and other older writing. I mean, even the nineties being old and the fact that there wasn't, you know, Google and stuff as I'm reading through it, I'm thinking, I'm coming up with all these kind of takes of my own and I'm thinking, Whoa, okay. I'm aware of this. I'm aware of that. Oh yeah. I've heard of this. Well, that relates to the, I'm thinking of that. But then I thought, well, I know all these things because I have access to the internet and I've access to all kinds of blogs that like consolidate all these different pieces of data and information and then you know present it in a nice little package for me to go read. But like, it's much more impressive to see somebody back in the 1980s, 1990s who didn't have any of that, you know, finding all of these little, just different pieces of information that, that now are just kind of handed to you on a silver platter. If you, you know, you get involved in these politics and kind of hey here's your you know here's your package here's the here's all the basic info you need to know now there there was something because i didn't do uh, it seems like you did like a lot of a bit at least a bit of research i kind of just wanted to take the book at face value and judge it off there is there a reason because like I, i was reading this thing and he doesn't really say i during the book he says we Right? Did you notice that while reading this? Yes. Yeah. So he he wrote it um, kind of in the voice. So he writes it from the perspective of his, you know, supposed movement that he's trying to start as his revolutionary movement. Um, okay. There... So he, so he wrote he wrote <laughs> he wrote it like in terms of like hope hoping I guess after the bombings that he had started a movement and a bit of a revolution. And at that point, the voice of we meant for all of those people. Exactly. And there's something okay. even more cryptic in the book where there are a few times when he talks about us and we, 
Um, there are a couple, maybe like three or four points in the book where he just says like us, FC. And I, I think I just like glossed over that in my first read through. Um, FC is, I guess, like a name he came up with himself in his head for his revolution. FC stands for Freedom Club. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, and allegedly, you know, in some of the bombs I did not that, pick up on that. I did yeah, not pick yeah, up on that. Yeah, it was a again, real again, subtle thing. Again, this is a guy who he had no, at this point, he's writing this book, no followers, nothing. And the entire book it's written as we and us, and he's a nobody. So it's kind of, again, when you when you read of it, read it like that, it's very interesting and in, in how it came to be. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I want to actually just hop back to the um, goals thing. Cause I, I just want to clarify, because this is a really important part of the book, again, that I didn't really get my first read-through. So with the goals, so he has kind of two ways he talks about goals. The first is that thing that he was calling the power process, um, and that's his idea that really humans need, again they they have to do like the basic fundamental survival types of things they have to do it with their own two hands you, you should be out getting your own food creating your own home you know getting firewood stuff stuff like that when those things are done for you so you were talking about how you know scientists will come up with goals and things like that so that and that gets into the second part of his view on goals which is really important so he talks about uh, this idea that he came up with, he called it surrogate activities. And really w what surrogate activities are is if your basic needs are met, you don't have to feed yourself, you don't have to fight for your own survival. He feels that then humans come up with, I think what he's, he views as kind of unnecessary, needless pursuits that it's busy work exactly but it's like you, you busy, basically come up with instead busy of work busy work <laughs> instead of busy work it's busy goals exactly you know? and, and now and bear in mind now you were talking about scientists to him that's busy work in his view yes. you know working away you know slaving away to try to cure cancer or whatever or create an, an airplane like that's busy work that's i mean it could be for the greater good it could help humanity but they still came up with it themselves. It's not like these. It's not like a scientist is struggling to to strive off the land, or they have to struggle for food. You know, they have all the food they need. They live in a home. They they got to do something. Okay, I'll try to find out how to cure cancer, and that's their busy work. But again, he he, he kind of uh, says it a lot nicer than that, but. That's the gist of it. That right? that is, yeah, and that, that's really important to understanding <laughs> the book and understanding kind of his motivation. Is again, he he's throughout the book, he's making this case that that not all, but but a lot of of current human suffering and chaos and disorder is coming from that lack of people fulfilling the power process that we built up these societies where now we have all these creature comforts. And you know, life is really pretty easy for the most part. Nobody, nobody's out lying, lying in the you know forest, freezing to death or anything like that. You know, even our poor aren't living that way. And but because of that, then he feels you know he feels that that's the cause of a lot of the social problems. Um, and his so Mark, what did you get? What is his um, prescription? His what's his recommendation to solve this problem? Of, of of unhappiness <laughs> caused by a lack of the power pro of, of people fulfilling the power process uh i don't have that i don't have no because he has a lot of uh things he says um the one the main point that i got from the book is a technology is bad it's bad for un bad for advanced countries leads to social unrest but his his big point is that Technology has not broken down society yet. <laughs> yeah. So his, uh, so and his his recommendation for this that and this what's is the recommendation? Of, what's so, the recommendation? <laughs> so, so he wants, I know because I 
I wrote a lot of notes down, but I don't know what I wrote down for his recommendation. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, and so that and that gets into why he was mailing out the bombs. Then is that he wants a worldwide. And I'm kind of skipping ahead to the the end of his thesis, and we'll we'll go back and we'll kind of fill in a lot of other really interesting details. But yeah, I mean, this is to kind of bookend the book. Start, you know, he has all these complaints about the power process. People aren't happy. They're not living the way they were, you know, meant to actually evolve to live. Therefore, he feels that people should band together, create a worldwide, a global revolutionary movement and dismantle the the industrial society that the current system we live in and get rid of it and, and he's very clear that it has to be a global movement that it can't be you know it's not going to work if only people in the united states do this because then the united states will just you know disable all of its technology and the rest of the world will just overtake us or whatever you know he's, he's very clear it has to be worldwide and he has actually three recommendations um, for how he wants people to do that. Um, I've got some notes here just pulling up. All right, well, yeah, I'll just go through them real quick. Recommendation number one to start his idea to start a global revolution. Instigate conflict between the masses and the elite to weaken the system. So he would want people creating tension, conflict, possible violence. He 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 does he makes it very clear that violence is not rule this is not a, a peaceful movement that it doesn't yeah. he, he says that it doesn't specifically need to be violent but that's absolutely not off the table in his view i i found what what i found interesting and again it's kind of like um i don't know if you've ever read or know nasim taleb for skin in the game you know I, what I'm talking about, or I nothing like that? Is he kind of a popular Twitter talking head? Uh, a tiny, tiny bit, um, but he's done other stuff. And he says a very interesting thing, and it reminds me of something that Taleb wrote where he says, uh, history is made by the active minority, right? And I think that goes to the side that wants to win will always beat the side that wants to be left alone. Uh, but it shows that it starts with a small group building to a bigger group. You know, if, if there is a shared goal among a minority and they want to fight for it, they could start it. Right. Yeah. No. That's, and so, that's so exactly even though, even though, it. even though like, yeah, you need the, need the whole world to, to come together to overthrow the industrial revolution uh it needs to start somewhere it needs to start small and grow but that's that's where basically he says that's where the revolutionaries start it starts off small and then it gets bigger from there um yeah no that and that's exactly what he says in the book here what kaczynski says as well uh yeah so you know first first goal the first strategy yeah again instigate conflict uh, second strategy, and this is interesting, he wants people, he wants his adherents to actually to encourage globalization, make countries interconnected to each other, because that way they'll be more vulnerable to system collapse, which uh, I thought was really clever. Uh, you know, like, again, you're thinking like back when he wrote this, you know, he didn't have the internet, he didn't have access to, to, he didn't have there was no internet right yeah, so like he didn't know <laughs> like obviously obviously at the time especially in the 90s uh at that point the 80s and 90s i think was like the the real start of globalization and kind of interconnecting countries together and like us basic the real real what globalization really is because technically speaking I would say uh, items are kind of equal, right? You know, like a TV that gets sent over to China and a TV that gets sent over from the States to China and China to US, like that's not really globalization. Globalization is when cultures get shared, right? 
And I think in the 80s and 90s, that's when it started to happen a lot more than any other point in history. Yeah, well, he specifically wants um, industry shared between countries because oh, that, yeah. that way, yeah. you know, if everything breaks down, well, well, you know, these are like some of the, and well, I guess the reason I thought this was so clever is because, you know, we, for example, the United States, we've shipped all of our manufacturing to you know, foreign countries. China's <laughs> making shipped... God knows how much, you know, like I think all of our drug, a lot of our drugs, a lot but of basically, our electronics. Because, because now everything is built in China and shared from China. If that supply chain were to go, like everyone else kind of gets affected at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> and that wasn't really the case at the time that he wrote this book, I mean, to my knowledge. So it, it just seems real. Well, I think at the time, insightful. at the time, in, in the 80s and 90s, that's when product manufacturing in China started to ramp into high gear, I think. Yeah. Where you started to see made in China more than any other point in history yeah and, well, you, and you know like right now the i mean apparently you know, the biden administration is kind of not provoking war with china but it, i mean it, it sounds like they're at least you know taking kind of a hostile stance toward china and russia and and this is kind of something that i've heard people bring up that well wait a second this is country is producing all of our cheap goods and our medicine and things like that <laughs> we can't you, can we really go to war with this country how's that going to work yeah, and that's exactly. I don't think we're gonna Ted... go to. I don't think we're gonna go to war with them yeah. anytime. Soon, well, and, but... and, and that's exactly what Ted Kaczynski wanted, though. He wanted all these countries to be interconnected, relying on each other for everything. And it, you know, if a big chunk of the system goes out, then you know half the world suffers from it. So that was his second strategy: encourage globalization. His third strategy, and people probably get a kick out of this, and we'll backtrack and kind of go deeper into this. Third strategy is avoid collaboration with leftists. Um, he, <laughs> for those of you listening to this and you haven't read anything from Ted Kaczynski's book, I had never read it before. He leans into and goes into leftists so much in this book, <laughs> where to a ridiculous degree. Yeah, the book actually starts out with and now the the reason that he said avoid collaboration with leftists. So first of all, he gives a at the start of the book he gives a whole critique which we'll, we can get into, um, and then at the end of the book, then he brings the topic up again, and he basically says, for this revolution to to work, you need to avoid leftists first of all for all the reasons outlined outlined at the beginning, but then also then he starts saying that they're they're just going to take whatever movement you create and they're going to derail it into whatever, you know, so they'll turn it into like Black Lives Matter or they'll turn it about like transgender rights or something like that. <laughs> yeah, he, he literally says that. He says, um, he says, I think he said at one point in the book, he says, <laughs> with leftist goals, it's about affirmative action and preserving a culture of superficial matters, whether it's food, music, or clothing, and that's what their focus goes to, right? And it's it's really interesting how how prescient the whole thing is. Like, and I'm I'm thinking at the time, I'm like, was it really that bad? Like, yeah. Like, okay, or did so he just, just to give know you an where idea it was all how going? Important this topic, is. and I think we should we should kind of go in a little deeper on his his writings on leftists. So the book starts, so each paragraph is um, numbered. The book begins with the, you know, the as you read, the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three. By paragraph six, he already transitions out of the intro and he's already into leftists in paragraph six, which is like page two in my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is how important that topic was to get like he says, right uh, the, into... The psychology of modern leftism, and then he just goes into it of about everything they do wrong. Yeah, and he says when we speak of leftists, <laughs> and it's exa exactly you now. You may be thinking like, okay, well, because you know, I get these terms change over okay, time. Can I just can I just I'm I'm oh, reading yeah. it right now. Can I just read a line? I just want to yeah. read this line. So so if you're listening to this, this is what he says at one point in the book. He says. 
Now, when we speak of leftists in this article, we have in mind mainly socialists, collectivists, politically correct types, and he puts it in quotations, feminists, gay and disability activists, animal rights activists, and the like. And I'm just reading that, I'm like, yeah, that really hasn't changed much. <laughs> Except you you would add a few more labels, right? Like he says, uh, feminists and, and gay, but again, he didn't realize that they were going to add a few different letters to LGBTQ, etc. Right? So... But he knew exactly who he was talking about. <laughs> yeah, and so he has two. So kind of, you know, he he kind of nailed, as we were saying earlier, he kind of nailed the the problems of modern society down to two things. Down to that, you know, we're not fulfilling this thing he called the power process, and we're coming up with all kinds of unnecessary surrogate goals we don't need. He did a similar thing with leftists, where he kind of drilled them down to two two motivations really and um and the, so the two motivations the first was a feeling of inferiority so these are people who just internally they just feel inferior unfulfilled i think off i think he thinks that they feel unfulfilled often because they're because of the problems that we're having not fulfilling that power process so that's one thing and then the other aspect so these are people who feel inferior and they're also, he came up with this term called over-socialization. And yes, he goes into that a bit. Yeah, that's kind of another one of those terms I didn't get quite as much the, my first read-through. But really, the, the over-socialization, he may have been able to come up with a better way to explain that. Really, when you read his description, so he talks about you know when a child is raised they grow up in a society, they're taught all the, you know, the mores and the things you ought to do and the things you ought to believe and the things you dare not say. And the people who are over-socialized are almost like they got too indoctrinated into that system. They got, they like, they took it, they drank a little too much of the Kool-Aid, like more, like there's probably an optimal level of socialization, but these people went way too, they're just re way too obedient, way too... Um, trusting of authority maybe and you know when i read that i i just think of like i mean my god look at the leftists today i mean these, these people are putting that over socialization on display in a way that's probably never existed in yeah. history i mean you look at the people you know just every with all, all of the the virtue signaling that goes on these days one thing one thing he goes into that i really took note of is how leftists take <laughs> they they really try to transform and change words right did you did you read this part where he says like they they don't like the terms negro or handicapped or chick they they want you to say african or asian or disabled person yeah and, and this is still going on today i'm like holy it's it hasn't changed it hasn't ch 30 years later nothing's changed yeah about <laughs> leftists so he says so i have just a couple passages underlined here i'm going to read okay so he says that and this kind of gets to what i was saying so he, he kind of identifies that one of their main drivers is that feeling of inferiority so he says okay about leftists um, they tend to hate anything that's been an image of being strong, being good, being successful. They hate America. They hate Western civilization. They hate <laughs> they hate white males. They hate rationality. Um, and then he goes on to say, you know, more importantly, the leftists hate science and rationality because they classify certain beliefs as true, i.e., being successful, being superior, and other beliefs as as failed or inferior. Um, the leftist's feelings of inferior run so deep that he cannot tolerate any classification of some things as successful or superior and other things as failed or inferior. Um, this also underlies his rejection, the rejection by many leftists of the concept of mental illness, the utility of IQ tests. Um, leftists are antagonistic to genetic explanations of human abilities or behavior, because such an explanation tends to make some persons appear again superior or inferior to others, so and man, he had this 
nailed. <laughs> he, he he like I'm I'm gonna read another passage because there are so many things on here. I was just like, this could have been written today. Let, let, I'm just gonna read this quick passage. Feminists are desperately anxious to prove that women are as strong as ca- and as capable as men. Clearly, they are nagged by the by a fear that women may not be as strong and as capable as men. Right, like that, <laughs> that right there, that that could have been written today. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes on into the. Uh, this is another good one. This I, I was reading this. And when I when I finish, tell me what you think when I when I finish when I say this. Words like self confidence, self reliance, initiative, enterprise, optimism, etc., play little role in the liberal and leftist vocabulary. And I'm reading this, and he goes, he continues. Do you know what I'm thinking of when I when I read that sentence? What's that? I'm like. Oh, he's talking about so, like how they're against self confidence, self reliance, initiative. Oh, he's this guy is Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, is this Jordan Peterson must have been reading this at one point because that's and he just goes into on and on about how much leftism is bad. You know what I'm thinking of when you read that? <laughs> you know that it was like a well, I was going to say it was a meme, but sad to say it wasn't a meme. Uh, it was more like an info. It was like a a genuine, like a sincere infographic made by some. I can't remember what organization, but they were basically, you know, they're attacking white culture, and they came up with this whole list of, of I guess things that need to be avoided or criticized because they're white culture, and it was all right. like it was like you know punctuality, you know, quote unquote hard work, work ethic. And yeah, and I remember people were sharing it around, kind of in jest, saying, "Hey, it sounds pretty good to me." Like, hell yeah, this is a white culture. But um, yeah, I mean, and that's exactly what he's listing here. How like they hate all that stuff. They hate punctuality. They hate hard work. They hate diligence. They hate you know the the search for truth and for you know exploration. They just they hate everything that really makes makes us us. They they hate they hate white males. Yeah. And and I'm I'm just reading a lot of that and I'm like, oh, this guy, this guy would have been a great YouTuber. Yes. He's saying the exact same points that uh that we talk about today, basically. Yes. And you know, I'll say so I remember there was an interview uh going around on Telegram last year with um William Pierce. And I, I can't remember what 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 uh organization he ran he ran he ran some kind of a like a pro like an old old school pro white group back in i want to say the 80s but um okay that's why the name sounds familiar yeah yeah he's the um i'm trying to trying to come up with some kind of like a famous thing to to connect him to and i'm drawing a blank but william pierce he was giving an interview on um like coast to coast radio and they were talking about ted kaczynski and he was kind of like uh kind of dismissing Kaczynski and saying, oh, I, I, you know, I don't get into that lefty stuff, leftism. Maybe I, maybe he hadn't read it, but yeah, just to clarify, Kaczynski is he's ab, absolutely a thinker of the right, both because he, he criticizes the left, but as you can see, he's not criticizing the left from like a like a left-wing point of view, like, hey, we're, we're not being liberal enough, guys. No, he's criticizing the, the core fundamental values yeah, like, of the left <laughs> the, their entire system is wrong yes but then there are there is there is a point in the book and and again this is kind of like this is where i was reading it and i was just thinking that maybe he just didn't have like part of the reason why he went crazy is that he didn't have all the pieces together because at one point he goes he, and says that conservatives are also fools and then goes into reasons of why they're wrong. Like they can't the, basically how, well, as you understand, every all of culture is basically shifting towards the left and conservatives can't conserve and hold on to anything. Right? Conservatives couldn't conserve the women's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. But, but. Um, and this is what I was kind of talking to you uh, offline. 
this, <laughs> he, at no point does he make the connection at all, at any point in the entire book, towards the Jewish question, and or make a connection that maybe part of the reason why conservatives are fools and conservatives are allowing some of these systems to break down is due to infiltration for a lack of a better word yeah and that that's interesting you know i so he was arrested in what was it 96 yeah i think i think it may have been 97 98 but it was it was within those three years around there yeah and so apparently so now again to get back to the thing of you know having no internet it was almost impossible for the average person to you know get like jay woke back in those days because you know where would your information come from it'd have to come from like a you know a reliable source you'd have some kind of a well all he would have are essentially think about the most true information at the time you could possibly have they would come from and this is crazy like we think even though we said how oh it was in the 90s that wasn't that long ago technically like when i think about it when you think about it 2015 is a long time ago like every few years it feels like such a jump forward in terms of where society was so for me 2015 feels like is technically it was less than 10 years ago but it could be 15 years ago in terms of where society is then versus now yeah and, and you know so i i think and, and another thing about him being arrested at the time that he was so again so he didn't have access to the internet he really couldn't get like you know jay pilled jay woke yeah no exactly but so apparently i actually I just heard this recently on a podcast uh, someone was talking about him and they were saying that he so he's he has published some books in from prison and apparently he's he's gone back and updated this book uh, I think he he put out maybe like a new edition with notes added to it or something, but uh, apparently he's kind of like adapted some of his thinking with the times and as he's read new information, which is you know it's it's always admirable admirable to see people do that in the first place. But having heard that, I'm sure that yeah, if he hadn't been arrested, if he had, if he, he had, well, first of all, if he hadn't been arrested, he would have wound up in these political circles that were in for sure um, well, and, and had he I, made I, his way he, here i don't even know about that well he uh, assuming he was like using technology the, which he he was he was alone do. in the forest in in a cabin so literally all he had to go by probably was some history books and some encyclopedias and where yeah. are you going to get information about anything like that in there Right? That's a good so, point. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's had probably he used like technology, <laughs> he would have wound up in these circles. But no, you bring up a good point. Yeah, he, he <laughs> wouldn't have made his way to it. You know, had he stuck to his guns, <laughs> like he wouldn't he have found he his would way have to been our politics. Still in the forest, you still would have been in the forest. I, yeah. if anything, like let's say he didn't. Let's say for the sake of argument, he didn't. Uh, he didn't blow up any buildings, and he just stuck to writing. Uh, he just I'm just imagining he just stuck to writing stuff like this, right? And people would read it and say, Hey, you're not mentioning the Jews. Where where is that? And then like <laughs> and then and then people let's say people wrote back to him and then he'd say, Why? What's wrong with them? Like they didn't do anything wrong. Because he wouldn't have any access to information the, the yeah. way we do now. So, <laughs> so it, it would just yeah. be kind of interesting. That, that is interesting. Uh, I think had the information gotten to him, just from what I've heard of him kind of re, you know, updating and revising his views, I, I do think that he would have – he's smart enough I – mean, put it this way. This guy's intelligent enough that back in the 80s – because bear in mind, he wrote this book in the 90s, but he was already recognizing these problems long before then. So yeah, this guy's he's enough of a, a pattern recognizer that <laughs> he would have picked it. You, you wouldn't have been able, you know, it's you know the conclusion he would have come to had the information crossed his desk. Yeah, well, you'd assume he would have figured it out at one point or another, 
But I do wonder where he stands today. And that was the other thing. I didn't even realize he was still alive. I thought he was put to death at some point, like by firing squad or he was hung or something or lethal injection. I didn't realize he was still alive. Oh, he's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So a couple of comments I wanted to make here about him. So just a, just a couple of biographical things. Uh, so just to run through these real quick. So born 1942, um, he was a, a apparently like a certified genius. Uh, I don't know if that was through an IQ test. Whatever you know, I, yeah. I I don't know if there's. I mean, I know if you score what is it like 132 on an IQ test, you can get into Mensa, but they're not like the arbiters of. Well, that was another thing. Interest. A really. Uh, I was I was reading that was one of the few things I read um about him in general is his IQ compared to other famous people. Right? Yeah, and he tested at what they said like 167 something. He was like at that. like 167 and there is only one every other person I've read it looked like he was smarter than them. You you pick you pick almost any other famous person, he's smarter than that person. There's only one person that I read who it looked like had a smarter and higher IQ than him. Do you know who that person is? Who's that? Kim Kardashian. What? <laughs> that's what that's what it was like. It was like he has an IQ of 167 and it was the article I was reading was saying Kim Kardashian has an IQ of like 170. Right, wow. but everyone that's... else is everyone else looks like they're one sixty five or below. Yeah, but he is smarter than all that, of them. So, so he did, he absolutely did test very very high. I don't. Yeah, yeah I'm well, not an again, expert in IQ. IQ test. IQ test does feel so unreliable. Like you can't trust any of them. Well, they I'm they've changed. What the... I mean, they're they're more consistent. So, if, for example, if you were to give him an IQ test today and give other people the same test you'd get a, a pretty consistent result. The thing is that like the the science of the tests themselves has evolved over the decades and they've had to continually tweak it. So it's not, you know, his IQ is very, very high, but whether, you know, whether he, like if he took a test today, like would he come out at 167? That I don't know. Um, and I remember, you know, Charles Murray, um, co-author of like The Bell Curve, one of the big famous books on IQ, I remember he was saying, you know, if you hear, like, like in today's world, you know, if you hear somebody boasting an IQ of, like, over 150, really, like, the tests we have to, they're not even calibrated to measure that high. It's like somebody taking, like, a, you know, thermometer or something like that and saying, oh, I measured, you know, 300 degrees on my, uh, you know, oral thermometer. Like, you know, it doesn't really go that high. But but regardless, though, his, his IQ was really, really high. So high that he got into Harvard at 16, which is incredible. Yeah. So, yeah, so so regardless, yeah, I mean, we can... The guy is, let's just, let's, as it stands, the guy is very smart. IQ, IQ tests, IQ points aside, we don't, those, those can be fudged, those numbers can be fudged. He was just incredibly smart. But he was, yeah, he get was into Harvard. enough to legitimately get into Harvard <laughs> at a time when Harvard was at going on merit, you know. If, it, was real, it was a real school at that <laughs> yeah. point. It was a real school at that point, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, in Harvard, when he went to Harvard, this is where it gets starts to get interesting. And I, I don't know if you read this in his biography. Um, so he did his undergraduate in mathematics, I believe. And he yes. was in a graduate program to get a PhD in, I think, mathematics. While in grad school, he signed up to be a part of an experiment, which was... This was the MK Ultra thing, right? Yes, which apparently, I've looked <laughs> into, has been just kind of like eerily named the Harvard experiment. <laughs> the the experiment. Yeah. So he signed up for, there was a, a psychology professor who was running an experiment. And he, I guess, you know, he signed up for it. I'm sure they were paid. They must have been paid very well. Uh, and I say that because this experiment they went, so they, the students were told, at least at first, they were told, um, you're going to be debating other students in this experiment. And so to start out on day one, you know, first first round of experiments, 
uh, what they had apparently what they had the students do was write out kind of write out like a little paper on like their dreams and their goals and their their philosophy on life and they were told that they're going to show up and they're going to be debating some other student about their goals well the, so they showed up for this experiment and the professor pulled the rug out from under them uh, apparently they were in a room alone in a room seated in front of that uh, what is that called that like double pane glass like the like the mirror that you know they, oh, the, they can the, watch the, you the magic them. mirror the yeah. magic mirror the so they're seated yeah, in the... front of that with a camera a hidden camera on them and then apparently there was a, a an experienced lawyer in the room just haranguing reading through the paper they wrote and tearing it apart tearing them apart on a personal level tearing apart their hopes and dreams and their goals and their philosophy um, and the whole idea, I guess, was to to see how far you could go before you get the person's like psyche to just snap. And then if that doesn't sound sedi- and it's bear in mind he was really young because he went to yeah undergrad at age sixteen, so he's like he yeah he's like whatever eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. So so that that was the first part. So they drive them to the point you're know, trying to kind of break their mind, break their psyche by you know, having this lawyer essentially like psychologically abused them then after that they brought him in a in an, I guess in another room with a TV and then they played them the video of themselves being psychologically tortured and then continued to berate them and then torture them as they're watching themselves being psychologically tortured on video and I, the reason I said they must have been paid well for this is that the students kept coming back no, even if, the thing is this. I don't even think they could have been. They might not even been paid. I the way these psychological experiments work is that they essentially convince the participant that what they're doing is a good thing and they're gonna benefit from it. I don't even know if they got paid for it. Like, did you read that they got paid, or you're just reading? I, that I'm this just happened? assuming. Like, he, I can't imagine. <laughs> it, it's assumed he, he did it's this for two. Assumed they got paid. So he did this for two years. This absolutely had some kind of an effect on him because he cited that he he later said that this was the worst experience of his life. And the professor, professor um, Doctor some Murray something, his last name is Murray, the professor who ran this experiment. He was a part of the early, the early MK Ultra um, experiments. What, what was that? The CIA running those, which was essentially the United States government experimenting on. I think MK stood for mind control, and they were effectively trying to. They were doing all kinds of just obscene, torturous uh, human experiments, trying to see if is it possible to control somebody's mind. Is it possible to to brainwash people to turn people into like assassins that you know like unknowing assassins? Um, and, and these those experiments involved drugging people against their will, against their knowledge, torturing them while they're drugged. Yeah, it was really over the top. And this professor came from those experiments. Um, and now it, it's never been like admitted that this Harvard study was an MK Ultra experiment. Um, I mean, it, it sounds obviously like it was. It sounds very, uh, again, it's one of those, well, we don't know exactly what it was, but it sounds like an MK Ultra experiment. At the very least, it was psychological torture, and I think we can agree with that. <laughs> it, it absolutely was. So I looked into this experiment a little more because my, so when I heard about it, so my first thought was, so I read about it a little bit, and they said that people had talked to this Dr. Murray, and they were trying to figure out, like, what the hell is he doing? And apparently he never, he could never really give people a straight answer on, like, what's the point of these experiments? What, what's his research about? And apparently he gave conflicting answers. I mean, he, he just, he wasn't being forthright with it. And so my first thought was, you know, Harvard should have some kind of records on this because when you know when they do these kinds of experiments, they have to go through. Uh, you know, if you're going to do, if you're like a professor, you're doing a, a psychological study like this. You know, it has to go through. They have a what do they call it, a human subjects review board, 
where you actually have to apply. You there, to, where there's regiment and testing, and it's like, okay, yeah, we can't, you, you have to get. We approved. can't do this testing on humans. We gotta, we gotta get some approval first. You have to lay but, out a case. You have to be approved. It has to be documented. I don't know that. You're you're making it sound like they go through actual testing. I think if as long as they can give a, a doctor to check mark off the 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 experiment that they can do it. Well, they I, do I don't whatever think Harvard want. would do this today. Now the interesting thing. So I I looked into the human um, human subjects review board. I, I looked into that. I, I was just curious. Well, when did they start that? And of course, it started like a decade after Kaczynski was in these. So at the time oh, that he okay. was at well, Harvard, there you go. <laughs> at the time he was at Harvard going through this, there was no no review board, and so that was something um, implemented by the I guess it was the FDA. And but at the time that he was in college, there was no review board. So I guess in theory, if you were a professor, if you could get the funding from someone like the government, the CIA. You could uh, allegedly you could do whatever study you wanted to do, and my guess is that the reason no one could get a straight answer out of this guy is because obviously it was it, my, my guess is this was some kind of a top secret. Well, project. yeah, it was like it essentially it was just, MK Ultra, where he was being funded yeah. by the government, he was being directed by the government, he was reporting to the government, and he didn't even he probably at that time he probably didn't even have to tell Harvard what he was really doing with these students and it's, it's it's kind of funny where that human you know i was kind of reminded of stuff i haven't been involved with for a long time but it was kind of funny like thinking back to the human subjects review board you know that came about because of this kind of abuse of you know studies like this like psychologically abusing people but like back in the day before they had all these protections for um for you know subjects or test subjects and people like that like like scientists like or researchers they just go right out and like dox people in their studies <laughs> like going back like like even like the 1950s yeah. they're like well, i'm gonna write a sociological paper on a uh, you know homosexual men and the anonymous encounters they have in the park and they would actually like work with them and you know follow them around and write about write a whole uh, paper about their lives and then they just go dox the guy and put all his info right in the paper. You know, Tom Johnson, who lives at 501 Main Street in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> so it's some of that stuff is kind of like why these boards came about. <laughs> well, yeah, they they were clearly again. It doesn't seem like it was on the up and up. No, yeah. When they were doing these things. So yeah, and, and Kaczynski, to, to get back to Kaczynski, I, I I'm convinced that this had some kind of a psychological effect on him. For sure. I mean, being 20 years old and being psychologically tortured by, like, a torture ex... Somebody who, like, specializes in psychological torture, I mean, that's... That has to leave some kind of a lasting effect on you. But, again, I'm reading the whole situation, and, like you said, he was bombing people, essentially sending smaller bombs, at least, for 10 years up until... uh, eventually has big one right so why couldn't they catch him before so did they just yeah were they so he, were they were they trying to catch him like it's not like he was moving to different cabins in different woods yeah so the story of him being caught yeah so he moved into his cabin that he, I, I think he and his brother built it it was uh, 1971 <laughs> built a cabin yeah. in, in rural Montana and you know, he was living there on his own. So one thing I didn't know, so when you hear this story, it's kind of told like he was completely isolated. It was just him living off the land. Uh, I think it, you know, 90% of the time it was, but apparently I found out there was, he was kind of near a small town and he did actually frequent that town and, and the people there knew him and he'd go and, and he like he had a garden at the town where he was trying to grow some food for himself. Um, and he, you know, the people there knew him. There were stores that he would go into and stuff like that. Um, so he did have a little bit of human contact. He wasn't totally alone. But right. Um, but he was mostly, yeah, mostly living by himself day and night in this tiny little cabin. He had books. He had a little fireplace and he just sat there i guess in the dark reading and hunting animals 
you know, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's kind of an unimaginable life. Uh, he decided to start bombing in 1983. Uh, he quote, he said he decided to get quote revenge against the system. After uh, you know, one day he went out for a walk. He had a spot uh, somewhere. It sounds like it was far from his cabin. I think he he made it sound like it was like a two day walk to get to this area. It was his favorite spot out in nature. Uh, one day he left. He took his two day hike to get out there. He got there and found that in the t- since the last time he had been there that they built a a road through it and tore a bunch of stuff down. And apparently that was when he snapped. He was so devastated seeing his favorite spot had been oh, they had okay. built through it that yeah. Then then he said that's when he decided to start bombing and get revenge. Yeah, because as as we talked about, like he goes over the big thing in the book is technology. Technology is bad, and what's interesting about technology is that it's constantly progressing. Like, it's like right now, we're not going to go backwards in tech. We're not going to go to a time before there were cell phones. Cell phones exist, and they're just going to get better and more powerful. Same with the internet. Internet exists. It's going to constantly get better and more powerful. And that's just what happens to technology. It constantly progresses, and as it progresses, it kind of make society worse which i can kind of understand yeah but uh... that that gets into so that that kind of gets into some of the so he kind of this is interesting and i I actually didn't even really think of this until you brought that up in relation to me bringing up him you know wanting to get revenge for his his spot in nature so he was partially kind of set off and started bombing things because his favorite nature spot had been demolished. But then there was the second part, I guess the final part of his manifesto that we didn't really touch on is that he, the, the, the urgent crisis that he sees coming down the pike is that this technology is going to take away human autonomy, that the technology is going to keep increasing and growing and growing and growing into the point where it's going to take away, basically destroy human life. It's going to take away what it, and not not in the sense that it's going to kill humans, but it's going to take away what it means to be human. Now he thinks that it's already taken away our ability to, to fulfill that power process, but he thinks it's going to get even worse to the point where uh, even you who don't care about, you know, not having to fulfill your power process, it'll get to the point where even you say, Hey, this is too much. This has gone too far. Again, again, (laughs) Reading this today, it's like, oh, that's pretty interesting. But you got to keep in mind, he wrote this before cell phones were a thing, before the internet was a, basically a thing. And he wrote this not knowing where things were going, right? At the same time, though, it's like, because I'm reading this and I can, I can get that. I understand that. But at the same time, it's almost like a double-edged sword because there is so much good that comes with technology that you can't you like yeah we could talk about the bad but there is so much good that comes with it as well you know like just doing what we are doing right now it was basically unthinkable back when he was writing this right people connecting with their ideas living so far away not really being connected or in any way related but the fact that we can do this right now and it's so simple so easy again these were things yeah. that i don't think he doesn't because again you read this thing he talks about the whole the whole book he just talks about how bad technology is and and the dangers and where it's all headed and how it's just making us less human and i'm just thinking eh, i don't know it's it's pretty good it makes our lives easier it, we can connect to people we can connect to family connect to friends i don't know there's some there's some good with it but he, well he, he has a whole glosses. section on that the, <laughs> uh, on the on titled the and i quote the the quote bad parts of technology cannot be separated from the quote good parts well that's the thing <laughs> there are there are there is but it's like again the whole book like 99 percent of the book is 
the bad parts of technology. And he is right. He is tr- right, though. And and that's kind of why it's especially for the government. It is a double edged sword because it can connect people in a way where people can want like this is what what the government should fear is that people can connect to each other and connect their ideas especially dangerous ones i'm not saying so well, think we it's have dangerous like, ideas like the powers that but, be should be the ones can, like wanting to like dial back technology yeah, and not yeah not so the, it's like not the public and there could come a time where like the government basically says that's it internet is canceled I, I can kind of almost see that within our lifetime. I, I like, think they. I think a lot of them would like to do something like that. But again, the internet is. I, I, I do wonder what his because again I haven't read anything past this book, so I don't know what his recent writings say. I don't know his thoughts on the internet. I don't know his thoughts on like what he thinks about government in recent years, but. Uh, so, Again, there's, there's. Sorry, what were we gonna say? Oh, I, yeah, I was just gonna give a, a really interesting example <laughs> that he came up with for for this idea of how you know the bad parts of technology can't be separated from the good. So, okay, so he talks about uh, medical technology, and he talks about how, you know, like diseases will be cured. And you'll you'll hear this, and you'll think of this as a good thing that we've cured, uh, whatever it is. we've cured some disease. And here you're you know you're thinking this is a good thing. Well, and then he he kind of brings up the point of how that's a double-edged sword by curing the the disease, the endpoint. Now more people are surviving who have this disease. They're having more kids. They're now passing on, you know, because they didn't die naturally of the disease, now they're passing on their genes that caused the disease, and now we're getting more of the disease in society. That's just one example he came up with. Um, and this is, I thought it was really interesting that he he um, kind of made that, used that as an example, because that is, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with like Ed Dutton, Jolly Heretic. I, I, I know, I, I know, I think I know what you're getting at, where it's kind of like, It's it's like we're we're taking out, uh, what's the word like natural Na- what, natural selection, word? natural yeah. selection. Yeah, and that's it's uh, like so it's like what should have a... died and what shouldn't have survived. Exactly, we're and, kind of like no, you don't. And, you're you're surviving. And him. Dutton's and, been a big promoter just... of the um, the his big kind of thesis is the spiteful mutant idea, which was actually it was coined by. Um, not by him, by Michael Woodley, uh, but basically the idea is exactly what Kaczynski is saying here, that if you go back before the Industrial Revolution in the West, you know, in, in England and the United States and these countries, childhood mortality was, I, I don't know exactly, I want to say like 50%, I mean, it was just ungodly high, and... And these were children dying of all kinds of different illnesses, infections. You know, some children would get an infection and their immune system was healthy enough that maybe you wouldn't even know they had one or they just got right over it. Other children would well, die. And the uh, Woodley's thesis, the spiteful mutant, is that you know, a lot of these people who were dying of various physical ailments, they all that there's a correlation between physical ailments and also mental ailments and these people that in the past, in ages past, were dying of physical things, when they died, those you know, mental issues that they would have got later in life were also dying with them. Today, we're keeping them alive. You know, we're giving them antibiotics. The kids aren't dying, which is great. I mean, nobody wants 50% of... And this is kind of the paradox of it, that nobody wants 50% of all of kids dying of infection and illness and stuff like that. But by saving their lives this gives rise to the idea of the spiteful mutant that now we have all these people with kind of mental issues that would have not, would not have made it to adulthood ages ago. And Woodley and uh, Dutton point to that as, as part of this reason for this, um, you know, rise and just insane deranged leftists that, that that's one element of it. And that's kind of what Kaczynski yeah. was saying with the, you know, we have this medical technology that's, 
it's great, you know, now half the kids aren't dying, which everybody's happy about. But now that's, you know, that, that's good, but now it's brought bad with it to where now we have the, the rise of the mutants in our society. <laughs> well, that's, I, I hate to say it, but that's kind of, uh, and this is going way off track from Ted Kaczynski, but that's kind of what happened in Africa. Where, for the most part, like, the reason uh to get to to get into it like we all know africa for having a incredibly large population right and this large population wasn't always like that when did the population explosion happen oh yeah yeah when we started solving their problem of childhood mortality yeah when we started donations and and african aid so basically when you look at population graphs and you see that population explosion in the 90s that's exactly when it started you know it's, so have you seen so those? when all these i hate to say this i hate to say this but that we we interrupted natural selection and natural selection took took care of their population where essentially what would happen is these families, they would have eight kids knowing at the time that only two, one or two, maybe three would make it to adulthood. And that's why they had the steady incline in previous years. But because it's like, it's like we gave, it's like we gave monkeys a machine gun. You know, it's like <laughs> no, that, that's it's exactly like what we just, he's talking about. We, that's how you just, can't separate just, the good from just, the bad. We just jump started their evolution, and if they're used to having eight kids, expecting two to make it to adulthood, now they're having eight kids, and they're all making it, and they didn't learn. They don't learn how to. They didn't learn how to feed for eight kids and eight teenagers, they only learned how to feed for two two teenagers because they only expected to have two teenagers with the rest dying, right? So so now they have a new problem where it's like, oh, overpopulation, and now these families are getting larger and larger because none of them are going through natural selection because we interrupted that. Oh, it's a disaster. And, and, and it's a and disaster they're, now. They're... Far, they're living far beyond their actual like carrying capacity of their of their own society, and uh, they can't maintain that level of population. I mean, w if our aid dries up, they will just have oh, it's, it's over. They'll just it's die over. in yeah. mass numbers. If, yeah. If we stop taking care of them, we stop giving them food, we stop helping them farm. Well, well, that's the thing. That's the. It's like I I, I have a few few notes about that. Number one. It's like we gave aid, right? But what's happening right now is China is assisting them, right? But what's the big difference? Yeah, China. Yeah, oh, well, and this gets to the thing. Yeah, if the help collapses, I mean, they may all no, die no, no. or they may all show up at our doorstep and want to come here. China's no, not no, taking no. them. The well, what I was gonna say is, there's a big difference between what's China, what China is doing, and what America did. America gave charity and aid. China is giving loans. Okay. Right? <laughs> oh, have you not read about this? No. So, oh, there's an article. I gotta find it. I know it's they something... definitely wouldn't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. I know they. Th oh no, like no, no, us. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's um, th there's a certain loan. Uh, let me quickly find it it's like it's a super controversial loan uh where it's like uh you can't be doing this africa doesn't know <laughs> what you're what you're what you're doing and then china's like shut up shut up <laughs> wow i'm sure there's some kind of provision we're, in there where it's like oh, you it's, know if you guys uh, can't hold up your end of the bargain then we just get to take a bunch of your resources or something like that <laughs> it's you know what it's called it's called a debt trap loan right and what that means is that that China is intentionally giving Africa a loan. It knows it won't pay, 
and eventually it's going to default onto China and then China will own it. Oh, that's what Have I was Have you thinking. not read about yeah. this? No, yeah. that's exactly so, so what called, I suspected. So it's called so it's called a debt trap loan, okay? And this is this is what a debt tra- do you know what the debt tra- trap loan is? What's that? <laughs> I I laugh when I read this. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I cannot I it's a shame I won't be here to see that." Basically, China gave Africa a hundred and fifty billion dollars, okay, <laughs> and they have to pay it back in a hundred years. Wow! <laughs> to which country? Like a, a whole bunch of countries, or one country? Uh, it was like a whole. It was like a few countries. So they 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 gave them. Oh no! Sorry, I was wrong. A hundred and eighty-five billion. It was a hundred and fifty. Uh, pounds, but 185 billion dollars, and they uh, Africa owes China in a hundred years, and we wow. and we all know how Africans are with abstract thinking. Yeah. so I'm sure they'll be fine. So you know when okay, their so society back... collapses and China takes everything, and they can't afford yeah, to exactly. feed their population. Now, have you see, have you ever seen that graph of the projected uh, population growth in Africa? Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, Steve Saylor he he refers to that as the most important graph in the world. And really, you know, when everything collapses, there, you know, I say they're all going to starve. Well, a lot of them will. And sadly, they will starve and die because we put them in a situation that they can never continue without our help. But a lot of you know millions of them will show up at our doorstep. And at that point, you know, if things haven't collapsed yet where we are, I mean, that'll certainly be the death blow. I mean, we will yeah. truly be Planet of the Apes at that point when that happens. <laughs> well, but... again, it's all those countries, again, I don't know where we're going to be at that point. But the point is, we, we as to relate it back to Ted Kaczynski, it's like, we skipped ahead on natural selection and we gave technology where it shouldn't have gone. Because yeah. kind of, <laughs> I would say, I would say at least in terms of like the Western world, we evolved with technology, right? So the reason we don't have, the reason we don't have large families, families were large back then is because like, when I say back then, I mean a hundred plus years ago, is because families had five, six kids, knowing maybe three, two or three would make it, maybe four, right? Yeah. Like we, they didn't expect everyone to to live, right? And but. Yeah. Well, you know, <sighs> on that note of everybody living. Um... And, you know, we started this by talking about how, you know, you solve a health problem, you know, you cure. So people develop a health problem. You kind of fix it after the fact. You cure it after they've got it. And then they have kids and they spread those genes. Well, he kind of envisioned this scenario where at a certain point he thinks that governments are going to to basically have like a state-mandated eugenics program, state-mandated um, – what do they call it? Uh, genetic yeah. engineering. Yeah, that was, where effectively, that, like, you know, so you, you get pregnant or you're going to get pregnant and there's some kind of genetic, you know, like there's mandatory And he basically says that the government is going to, it's like, oh, you think the, the government is in your life now. Wait until they mandate your child has certain genetics yeah. in him. Yeah, so you get pregnant <laughs> and then you have to get an MRA va- mRNA vaccine to change your fetus's genetics DNA. because, well, we know yeah. it's going to have all these various problems. We know, and it can even get down to behavioral stuff. We know it could be prone to crime. It could be prone to religiosity. It could be prone to anything we don't like. And so we, you know, for the greater good, we're mandating that you take this gene therapy, this mRNA, to fix whatever problem. And you know, as I'm reading this, I'm th- no, he didn't, I, I'm the one adding the MRNA thing. He didn't, yeah, he yeah. didn't bring that I, up. Well, the, but the as thing I'm is, reading this, he... I'm thinking of <laughs> yeah, our go handling on. of COVID and there was seemingly no end to how, to what leftists were ready to mandate on people for the quote unquote greater good. So I'm reading what he's saying, thinking, absolutely. 
if the government rules out some kind of a vaccine, you know, every pregnant woman has to take this because this is going to solve crime. This is going to do anything. I mean, as we've seen, I mean, with enough propaganda, you can get apparently get people on board with just about anything. Yeah. And yeah, and so I can yeah I, I can really see what he's what he's the point that he's making with that that yeah that this could lead to to, to you know, government mandated gene therapy for for your kids. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why his biggest thing he's like if we can if we before we can do anything before any <laughs> any. The only revolution that needs to be focused right now is like dismantling the technology within the system. He says that like that it should be the only goal, destroying the system and work from the ground up basically. And he makes a really interesting point. Do you have the book in front of you right now? I do. I I, I laughed when I read this cuz I'm like Maybe, maybe we were, like society was so over the target that this is what happened. Go to paragraph two hundred one, and just read the first two sentences there, and it just sounds very, it sounds very prescient for where we are today. If you could read paragraph two hundred one. Suppose, for example, that the revolutionaries took quote social justice as a goal. <laughs> Human nature being what it is, social justice would not come about spontaneously. It would have to be enforced. In order to enforce it, the revolutionaries would have to retain central organization and control. For that, they would need rapid long-distance transportation and communication. Therefore, all the technology needed to support the transportation and communication systems. Yeah, and then he just goes on and on. Yeah, he just goes on and on from there. But I'm like, I was reading that, and I was like, holy. Like, if only he knew where he could... Where, like, he's in prison, but... He has to have some idea that that's going on right now. Well, yeah, and there was a, a brilliant quote in this book, kind of on that same note of how you know they'd have to use all this technology. Okay, here it is. Um, so I'm going to read these two um, little sent these two sentences, kind of out of order. They really flow together. Though you read them in this order. Okay, so play, you know, playing on that note of you know what could happen if these kind of bad actors did get a hold of, of our modern technology, which again, in the nineties, that was not so much the case, but to, well, it kind of was. So he says, okay, so in the, in the United States, a couple of decades ago, so going back into the 60, 50, 60, 70s, a couple of decades ago, when leftists were a minority in our universities, leftist professors were vigorous proponents of academic freedom. But today in those of our universities where leftists have become dominant, they have shown themselves ready to take away from everyone else's academic freedom. This is political correctness. The same will happen if leftists with leftists and technology. They will use it to oppress everyone else if they ever get it under their control. And then he yeah, says... Yeah, I was... I remember... <laughs> and then he says if leftism ever I remember ever reading becomes, that and I was... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, I, I remember reading that I'm like... It, it's kind of chilling at at times like that. I was like, "Oh, yeah, it's, that's kind of where we are now." Yeah, like, yeah, and and he talks about how leftists, you know, if they ever become dominant in society, which, hello, <laughs> today, yeah, uh, if they ever do become dominant, well, they're there. Uh, so well, that's the, the thing. Leftists are not. Uh, I would still say, leftists are not dominant, but that's with an asterisk. Leftists are the loudest. And they hold the most power. Yeah I, yeah, I would say their right? their zealots are dominant. I mean, clearly, well, I mean, we, like, we all have to abide by their their rules. Yeah. Uh, but he just talks about how leftists will they'll eagerly. So he says that uh, if they ever become dominant in society, so that the technological system becomes a tool in the hands of the leftists, they will enthusiastically use it and promote its growth. Um, and he talks about how they'll, you know, they'll be really enthusiastic about technology because it can be used to promote their goals and crush their opponents. And you know, just look at how they're using it to. I mean, we're look at what's going on today with doxing. Well, they can hunt down anybody who doesn't, you know, anybody who transgresses to their... <laughs> any 
any, uh, you know, well, you use the wrong ideology. pronouns. Yeah, and use they're the they're pron- yeah very excited about using technology to to find those people to punish and destroy those people. Uh, they like using technology well, to bring it back to COVID. And again, this is driven by leftists that during COVID they took the same kind of pleasure and glee in using all the QR code. I mean, for God's sake, look at Australia and New Zealand using technology to lock people out of hospitals, lock people out of restaurants. Uh, so, I mean, and it's exactly what he was saying that, yeah, that they'll, they'll enthusiastically embrace this technology because it's a way to both to, to pursue their goals. They, they somehow, they think they're going to create, you know, this, this egalitarian utopia heaven on earth. They think they can do that. And then on the other hand, they also, they like using these tools to destroy their enemies too. And that's absolutely happening today. Yeah. Yeah, there was another thing about autonomy. So so again, so this all gets into, you know, kind of his final red alert alarm to you, the <laughs> reader, is that this is all going to build up. So he's already, you know, he's already pushed over the edge enough that he's bombing buildings he understands that you're not but he's trying to tell you that it's going to get to a point where you're going to be upset and it's going to get to a point where you're going to lose all autonomy now he talks about autonomy in two ways and again this is another one of those things i didn't pick up my first read through so he talks about humans losing autonomy in the in the way that you would think that technology is going to control you know like you're not allowed to go out to eat because you didn't get a the, the hyper 1984. Version. Yeah, he talks about <laughs> he talks about autonomy in that sense, but the, he also he talks about autonomy in another really interesting sense that he throughout the book he's constantly talking about primitive societies and how primitive yes. societies are superior, they're better. When he talks about autonomy, he's talking down to the level of he wants people living like you know if you see videos of hunter gatherer tribes and anywhere in the world that's his idea of autonomy down to the level of he doesn't just want the ability to you know go out and do what he wants when he wants he talks about even things like like stoplights and stop signs like even that's impeding on your well because i think i think he says i think he goes into it because again this is kind of like I don't want to say it, but it's like it's like this is this is your mind when you become an extreme libertarian, <laughs> where <laughs> where basically he says he's like you know back in the back in those days like the primitives they they're more freer than you are you know yeah it's like, well, well and, and he wants freedom so. down to that level <laughs> yeah no he talks about even it's like, like <laughs> even even speed limits being like a an unnatural imposition if you if I want to go from here. I'm sitting on a rock right now. If I want to go from this rock to the lake, I should be able to get there at the speed I choose when I want. I should be able to take any route that I want. And if I have to follow a road, if I have to stop at a stop sign, that's an imposition on my autonomy and it's having an effect on my mental health and my spiritual well-being. So he he gets down to that level that he he wants people walking by foot See, through that, the woods. But that's the thing. It's like he's okay. <laughs> he's okay with the t- technology of the car itself, you know? <laughs> well, not really. So so there was a spot where he actually talked about, like, the technology that he would accept. And it, it really it comes down to if an artisan can make it. So if a single human being could make something, uh, like a, a cabinet or a bow and arrow or something like that, like, he's okay with that. He's not okay with anything that takes an industry and multiple people. That's like his cutoff where he thinks it starts to get destructive. But if it's something, you know, an artist, artisan can just fashion by hand, then that's, that's kind of his cutoff. So basically kind of, I guess like the Amish pretty much. Yeah. Right. Like, but again, I think he just takes it to such an extreme degree where it's like, well, sorry, as you even said yourself, technology has advanced it's like we've opened pandora's box we have all this now there's no going back and the same goes for stuff like um 
Maybe that's why he loved his bombs, you know, because he built them himself. It was just one man doing it. Although there are the conspiracies where we didn't really even get into at all uh, with the the city bombing itself. I haven't heard those. Are there like conspiracy theories that he didn't, he wasn't the bomber or something like that? Yeah, yeah. There's... I think he. I mean, even just the the little clips I heard of him in an interview. I am pretty. He he talked like now he in in the interview he said for legal reasons you know, he's not admitting to anything, but I mean he sure talked like somebody who mailed bombs around. He may not have been the only bomber, but he he talked like a a, a guilty person. You know what? I was I was mistaken there. I was mistaken there. Oh, you're thinking of Maybe. a different. <laughs> Yeah, I was different thinking of a different bombing. Bomber. I was, <laughs> but but you know what? Uh, again, like I just find it so weird they couldn't catch him. Like he sent out bombs for ten years and they they couldn't catch him. So the crazy story about how he got caught. Yeah, so he was in the woods again. He had no paper trail. He, for all intents and purposes, didn't even. But I'm exist. like, I'm like, how did he send out? I, I like because I didn't again. I didn't really look into it, but I'm like, how did he send out the bombs? Okay, so <laughs> when you ask how he didn't get caught, he, and this is kind of an interesting thing, I, I, I had never looked into kind of his the terrorist aspect of him, and it's something that people don't really, like in our circles, you don't hear people talk about. So apparently, and I told you there was that small town he was living by. Right now, you hear about him mailing out these bombs, and he was mailing out bombs to universities, to computer stores. He wanted to cause chaos and fear. He wanted to start his revolution. But now you, you might hear that thing. Okay, he's kind of like a hero who did what he had to do, sort of. You know, he didn't really want to kill people, but he had. But you know, like with the town that he was living by, allegedly he also had kind of like a small scale terror campaign in that town just against people he didn't like. So he wasn't just, it wasn't just like all political, like he's trying to save the world in his own mind. He, and when he asked like, how didn't he get caught? Apparently when he was terrorizing the town near him, he was so clever in how he went about it. He uh, made like custom made, shoe like fake shoes so he had his shoes on but he custom made like fake like small shoes like a small teenagers or kids shoes and put them under his shoes so apparently when he walked around town his footprints looked like a kid walking around so they would never even think that it was him like that's how far he went to cover it like just crazy lengths that he went to cover. He went to lengths to, yeah, and, yeah but apparently he was like killing people's dogs in town and doing yeah so he was you know not just like like even if you think what he did with the bombs was heroic i'm not, i'm absolutely not saying that here but even no, if somebody no, no. like i again thinks that he was kind of you know he's like out like killing people's dogs around town and stuff like that so again he, part of part of what he was doing and as he said he only did it just so that his writings would get the attention that he wanted. Yeah. It wasn't about bombing certain people or killing anyone. It was about getting the attention towards his writing. And maybe there were like he I think if he didn't kill anyone, <laughs> he he would be regarded better maybe, but uh because Absolutely. He did, yeah. He he'd be held in much higher uh regard if he had just but because the book, he did it maybe like, like blew up can't... some property or something but that was it but no he he killed people yeah. and maimed people now when you asked how he got caught i'm gonna run through this really really quick and this is kind of an incredible story so he mailed out all these bombs to places he put all kind of, so he put um not clues but he put f- uh, like decoys in the bombs and in the packages so that when the authorities found his bombs and they found the remnants of his bombs, he'd leave all kinds of like um, just fake initials and photographs and just all kinds of weird stuff. Just to, just you get him looking everywhere. They had no idea where to look, who he was. And right. so as he was getting into the 1990s, as he's like getting better and better and like actually getting to the point where his, bo- his bombs are getting better and better and he's like killing people he he, sent he forgot out all... tracking technology was getting better too well yeah and they had well they hadn't tracked him 
But what he did is he, he, I guess he wanted to bring it to an end. He mailed, so he wrote this book, Industrial Society and Its Future. He mailed it out to a handful of um, different different um, news outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post, a whole bunch of different places, I think. And he, he basically sent an ultimatum, I think, to them and to the police saying, I'll stop mailing out bombs if a mainstream out a mainstream source publishes my book unedited with no edits oh. if they put if they put the whole thing out there and at first i want to say it was playboy offered to publish it and then he and he wrote back to the police and he said like well playboy is not a prestigious uh you know outlet that people are going to read so if they are going to do that then i reserve the right to bomb you know a couple more people if it's going to be in playboy and then, and then uh, I guess the New York Times and the Washington Post. Let's see, I ha- actually have it in my notes. Yeah, New York Times and the Washington Post in uh, September 1995, they both published it unedited in their um, newspapers. And I guess after that, he he did stop bombing it. Now his brother, he had a, a younger brother, who had been close to him for a while. His brother actually lived in the woods with him. Uh, and that that's like way way back when he first went out there in the early seventies, and I guess his brother's wife, hearing the story, suspected that it was you know Ted was the bomber, and she kind of like urged the brother to you know read the manifesto, and I get he didn't want to, but his wife told him like you need to read it because I think this is your brother bombing people, and he read it and said like yeah this is like you know the stuff me and my brother talked about, and this is my brother's writing style. And he told the FBI, and then they, you know, they followed his lead, and they went out to the cabin out in Montana and arrested him. So I guess he could have stayed there. Yeah, for a long yeah, time. No, it was only because to. his brother. I mean, had his brother not been involved, he probably wouldn't have been caught, just because of how how unplugged he was from the system. Yeah. I mean, if he kept doing like it if... in the modern times with all the video cameras we have now, I mean, that he may have been caught because of that but if he had stopped like in the mid 90s and his brother but again had never if you done that. if if he wanted his readings like read like i don't think he again when he talks about technology in the book he talks about like medical advances he doesn't really talk about actual like what we talk, like i think uh, i was ta- telling you there is maybe in the entire book that he talks about technology like it's not for a hundred plus pages. It's almost a hundred pages. There's maybe two instances of the word internet in the book. Yeah, and that, and that is interesting <laughs> to see that written at you know at that point in time when at least in you know in the U.S. we had like you know AOL, America Online. Like if you were lucky in 1994, 1995, you had it. Yeah. almost nobody had it at that time. Now he he frequented a library in that small town that he was by, so they may have had some kind of internet that he was like seeing, because um, he did say something in his book like, well, well, you know, I had to kill people to get my manifesto out there, and like, you know, and the reason I had to kill people is because we have, you know, we, I or we, we have no access to big platforms into the mainstream media and the internet's not going to do it. You can't use that to reach people, which it was really interesting to see that at the time. It's like, wow, man, it, yeah, if he had, and I remember hearing someone make the comment, like if he had only just like held off and not done anything for like five years, he would have, would have had, I mean, he would have been maybe like a, you know, a cult internet figure, you know, if he would have hung out, hung in there to like the year 2000 or so. Yeah. Yeah, it's again. I'm, oh, I, it's just interesting, like how little the internet is talked about. Where maybe at the time it was just kind of like, oh, it's just something you could do, uh, like you could do a search on, right? But uh, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, I mean, expect- I, I remember it at the time. I mean, I started using it like '96. I want to. I mean, one of my friends had like America yeah. online as early as like 1996. And yeah, I mean, there were tons of little websites people built, but just the nature of it. I mean, nothing could go viral. I mean, even if you had a popular yeah. website, you know, you had like, wow, no, there was like a thousand well, the, the words on my site. The only thing that went viral 
it's like technically speaking, like I remember when it was first talked about, is like, oh, you could go to Yahoo or you could go to Google and then you can look up things. Yeah. You know, and then that was it. That was basically it in terms of what is something popular on the internet. Nothing was really popular. Oh, like, yeah, but... and, and at that time, yeah, like 1995, yeah, there was just nothing viral. Yeah, so, the, uh, so I mean, he was right that, yeah, at that time you couldn't use the internet to – you know, to, to get a platform. Yeah. Honestly, even if he had, had held out till like 2000, I mean, you could make blogs at that point, but still, I mean, things, things really didn't go viral until the, the, the current in, you know, incarnation of the internet, like 20, when, you know, whenever smartphones and social media got basically nothing went viral until like early two thousands, like even in the nineties, there wasn't anything that went, viral like i think the thing the closest things that went viral like earliest internet memories i guess you could say are uh, there was that car ad (laughs) do you know what i'm talking about that was the jump scare car ad i don't remember that no oh there was a there was like a jump scare car ad it would maybe it wasn't even a, a car ad it was it was like a car driving in the mountains and then something would come out and scare you. It sounds. Was this like post YouTube? Maybe like two thousand. It was pre. No, this was pre YouTube. This was pre YouTube. Okay. No. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of sounds familiar, but I I can't pick. It would be it. like one of those things that you'd you'd uh, like that was something that went viral. Like I'm trying to think of things that were viral pre YouTube. Oh, you got, know, like you know, like those like, websites that had the little flash animations and stuff, like the yeah, Dancing flash Badgers animations. and stuff like that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but but even though I mean, if you if you could go back and look at how much um, how many views those had, like back in the day, I, I bet yeah. they'd have you know have like ten twenty thousand views. So even by today's well, standards, well, it wouldn't be like viral in the way that we in, think of what's it. What's interesting. And and this is something that a lot of people like. If you weren't around at the time, you know, like, like we were so starved for content, where basically, if something were to go viral, it would stay viral for like six months. For six months, people would talk about it. Yeah, it's not like yeah. it's not like <laughs> it's not like it's not like today where. Where something goes viral, everyone passes it around, and then everyone's tired of it by the time next week rolls around. It's like, it will stay in public consciousness for six months. Yeah, no, I, I remember those days. Yeah, like your friends would send you links on like, like AOL Instant Messenger and yes. Yahoo Messenger. And, yeah, you get and, links from your friends. And, yeah, it'll and everyone be the would same. be sharing it would little be the... vid- flash videos and little songs and stuff. Yeah, and it, it would be the same picture, the same like same what were they called they were like image macros i guess you could say that was what memes were back then yes yeah and <laughs> all the yeah stuff. yeah <laughs> so i just wanted to read a little thing here and kind of kind of move toward the end of the uh analysis so and, and this is i think people find this really interesting so he says he's talking about the future and you know, he again he talks about technology. He does talk about automation, which is you know a hugely relevant topic now with AI. Yeah. Uh, not not just like machine automation, but brain automation with Chat GPT and all these things. Where I just saw something this morning where 3M is just not going to hire people whose jobs can be done by AI now. I think I think they're laying off 8,000 people, and they're just never going to hire. Like I guess if they think a position can be performed by AI, they're just not going to hire people for those jobs ever again, allegedly. And um, so, you know, people are looking at this saying, well, hey, we're hurtling toward a future where human labor is not going to be almost unnecessary. And, you know, what what are we going to do? How, how is our economy going to work? How are we going to survive? How are What, what are we even going to do to pass the time? And he kind of was foreseeing that back again back in the 90s before this before anyone was like looking that far ahead and where this was headed 
And he says, so he, so he kind of lays out what I just said and talks about how, hey, there's not going to be a need for work. There's not going to be a need for us, for humans. And he says, yeah. if, the, if the elite is ruthless, they may simply decide to exterminate the mass of humanity. If they're humane, they may use propaganda or other psychological or biological techniques to reduce the birth rate until the mass of humanity becomes extinct. Yeah. And yeah, there were there I, were some scary. We could probably prescient, go on a whole uh, yeah, a whole like separate show <laughs> on that. I think anyone listening to this is familiar with the at least the theories of, of things that may be going on in the world right now. Certainly, you know, fertility is going down and no one can figure out why. But you hear that and you think, Yeah, that's Well, you know what the, there was an interesting theory I read about uh low birth rates, right? And why they are that way. And um, I had never, not once did I even consider this to be a possibility. Because when we think of low birth rates, we think, well, they're putting something in the food. They're, uh, like, it's something we're giving ourselves. Like, oh, maybe it's in the vaccines. Um, maybe, Maybe we're just not, like, with people the way we used to be. But I actually, and but then you read about like how uh, people, especially males, have like low sperm counts and all of that, right? And you've probably heard almost every theory there is, or at least quite a few, right? Oh yeah, right. But what do you think of this? What if over the past, let's say, fifty plus years, all right? What if during that time period, it was constantly reading propaganda about how the world is overpopulated? And when I, we say the world is, when I say the world is overpopulated, we're reading this in Western countries, and it says, "Oh, the world is overpopulated. There's too many people." And what if we essentially brainwashed ourselves into believing this? And then that caused our own wow. birth rates and sperm to drop. So you think it's almost almost the way that like some amphibians, like they can kind of like recognize, like like they can change their sex. Like, hey, I need to reproduce. I need to, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, but I think yeah, they may be able yeah. to look around like, and say like, there aren't enough like females and they turn into a female like or to a male. Like it's possible, like it's possible. What if it was, and, and maybe, maybe that was the case, but... Clearly, it's all bullshit. But <laughs> what if we had brainwashed ourselves and pulled a psychological trick on ourselves for it to get that way? So they're saying kind of like the body can almost respond. Like you can see like the, the, tribe, the tribe that you're in and see if the tribe's getting too big. We don't have enough food for the tribe. And it's almost like your, your body can almost start like shutting down its reproductive systems that the tribe doesn't grow. Exactly, bigger. but it, it happened on a... I've never heard that. That's very interesting. I, I don't know if that kind of a thing is possible <laughs> or if they could test it or what, but that's a, it's at least an interesting idea. Right? Like, because I'd, I'd never... I read that, and I'm like, that... It's, it's kind of crazy, but at the same time, like, that's not crazy enough where it can be ignored. Because the, uh, the alternative is we're poisoning ourselves. Yeah. Or, or we're, we're eating something we shouldn't be, right? Um, but I, I think that that's, that is one thing. Uh, there are a few, a few final things I did want to get, go over. There was sure. one line I read in the book and I was just, I was just kind of laughing because the guy says, Ted says, and I quote, the world today is going crazy. And I just thought how that must have been, <laughs> that's pretty quaint <laughs> reading it yeah. from today's standard. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, and then, cause, but, but the thing is we all live in somebody else's past, right? Like he was living his present and his present, he was nostalgia and pining back for when things were normal in the seventies and eighties, right? He's like, the world today is going crazy. And now we're living in the present, and we're saying, "Oh no, no, the world is, the world is crazy now, right?" 
to but us. We are living his his crazy times living... are our good old days that we we do <laughs> exactly. anything to his, go back to. We're we're nostalgia for the times where he said it's going crazy. And right now we're living in someone else's past. And right now there are there are like eight year olds where this is their life right now. Today is their life right now where there's drag queen story hour and trans teachers or whatever and 20 different genders to choose from and that eight-year-old is going to grow up and in 20 30 years they're going to be thinking back and how the 2020s were such a good time and how the year 2050 is so fucked God, that reminds right? me of some there's a meme kind of getting at that I, I think i've seen it in a couple contexts but the main meme is like I want, it's like an image of some kind of a soldier guy or i don't i can't remember if he's from a video game or what. Oh, oh is that the one where it's like never forget what you're fighting for uh no no this is the one where he's saying like he's kind of looking at i think they're maybe on a vehicle and he's like looking back at you and saying like hey i know times are bad and this is you know we're just we're in hell right now and he kind of maybe like leans in and says something like but it's going to get so much worse from here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of, you know, like kind of what you're talking about. Like 30 years from now, we may be looking back at the 2020s. Like, God, if only we could go back to the, the good old days of the 2020s. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's the thing. Think what like, that we're, living, is look like. we're living in someone else's past. And right now, these are the good times of someone's someone's future, which is a scary thought. Like, yeah. it, it's just going to get worse before... <laughs> It needs to get it, it eventually it get be, it will get better but I don't think we're going to be living in the period of when it does get better. It needs to get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah. And that's the that's really what it comes down to. So I I wanted to say that line where he says the world today is going crazy and I'm just rolling my eyes reading that. And uh, there was another one. I, I spoke this to you about you. I, I spoke this uh, offline as well, where he says, where he talks about propaganda. I was just and... going to bring that up. Is that where you, okay, so he you almost can, kind can, of like can... talks about memes? <laughs> I, I don't know if you're talking about the same part that I am, but he almost he almost outlines like the need for memes. So he talks about, and, yeah. and I can really appreciate this because... Ba- so when I first started kind of getting red pilled, and this is like long before there was even like the alt right movement, and then even at the start of the alt right movement, like 2015, like the stuff I was into, um, I would you know I was reading these like lofty intellectual blogs and all these all this data and stats and these just heavy analysis and explanations of all these different phenomena and scientific things, and. I think, you know, I found it interesting. I think at the time I felt like, well, everybody will find this as interesting as I am. Everybody will find this as persuasive as I do. <laughs> and and he basically outlines the need for kind of like a two-tiered messaging system where he, on one hand you need uh, an intellectual core of people who are sitting there, the autists who are going through the data and they're, you know, they're they're actually doing like the heavy lifting but then you also need effectively, and he, he almost like describes the need for like memes, that you need to get these radical ideas that he wants to you know tear down the system communicated in these simple ideas. And I, I don't know if this is what you were talking about with propaganda. Um, so with the, uh, the lower um, level, he was just saying you know you need like a sec like a dumbed down second level of where the ideology can be propagated in a simplified form that'll enable the unthinking majority to see the conflict of technology versus nature in unambiguous terms. And I just, again, I just think like memes when I hear that, how you have so many complex ideas where God, I could write like a whole article on this. And then someone will just come along with like a meme where it's like just an image of a guy, a map, a little quote about it and oh yeah i get the whole thing you know it, it tells you the whole story right there and a, a million people share it on social media <laughs> yeah no but what, what i was gonna say is uh the exact line he says because yeah you're right um we memes are probably the best tool and most utilized by the right wing and conservatives because they're able to present big ideas really quick and concise better than anyone and that's probably 
the best thing they're at. But uh, the line I was getting to is where he says, uh, propaganda, propaganda can be used as, as a tool for good, such as discouraging child abuse and racial hatred. Oh, yeah. I remember this one. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm just, I remember reading that, and I'm like, Oh, oh, Ted, Ted, Ted. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, uh, that, that ends up becoming a tool of uh, the government. And yeah, I think he. Left. I think that's probably one of the things that he would have definitely backtracked on if he saw where we're at today. <laughs> but again, and and what I was saying is like, it's not so much. There is no racial hatred. Like no one hates someone else because of their skin color what ends up happening is people see uh, people make observations about certain things and then they use their best judgment to come to certain conclusions and notice patterns it's pat- and that's pattern that, recognition <laughs> pattern recognition is basically racism but uh, we won't go <laughs> we, we don't need to go into that so let me ask you so let's move kind of move into kind of sort of closing thoughts on this um kind of what were your thoughts on his his goal his his idea now obviously i think he has a very very good critique of leftism i think he has a yeah i think he has a really good critique of even technology i mean I, i do agree that we're headed toward a place where uh, uh, no, I'm not, I, I don't really share his concern about, you know, speed limits or anything. You know, I, I don't. <laughs> well, again, that's the extreme libertarian. Yeah, I don't go quite that like, far with autonomy. We... <laughs> but, you know, and yeah. to get back to memes and meme messaging, there's a meme that I thought of when I you know read his concerns about autonomy. And this is a concern <laughs> I've had for years now. Uh, there's a meme floating around. I've seen it a couple times where it says something like, the year is 2050 and I'm locked out of my refrigerator because I misgendered somebody yesterday. And um, it, it's kind of getting at how, you know, we're going to have all this smart technology, smart you know, cars that are connected to the internet, refrigerators that are connected to the internet, TVs. And I really do see human autonomy well, being because threatened the, the... by these but not 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 in the sense of like one evil guy is going to come and push the button and control everybody. It's going to be it's slowly bit but it, by it, bit. It, it, it's it just gets chipped your, away. Exactly, it's, it's away. just your car company, and they just want you to only do the X Y Z, and that's it. But then the TV, you know, your smart TV will, you know, well, because all these companies, when you buy these products that are hooked into the internet you know it's like you have this relationship with that company for forever until you get rid of the product and you know as like is social... there gonna come a point is there gonna come a point where they're like okay well you used a racial slur so we're gonna be stopping your internet privilege i re- i re- right? it, and it's <laughs> gonna get more and more re- I, I foresee it getting more and more restrictive where over time it'll be hey well okay we're uber well and companies like uber they've already blacklisted guys in our political circles and I can yeah. see that getting more prime. Okay, if you want to take an Uber, you just you have to do this. You have to do that. If you want to use our internet service, our phone service, you have to do this. If you want to, you know, you get a smart TV. If you want to use the TV, well, we're listening to you, and we heard you. We overheard you using the N word in your house. Well, we're we're not gonna, you know, you've lost your TV privileges for a month. And, and it's gonna get more and more restrictive. Beyond, I, 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 I foresee things moving in that direction. I, I could see them moving in that direction, but it's gonna be like. They really need to chip away to get there. I just don't see it happening even within five years. It might even be 10, 15 years. The, yeah, the I big can see issue, over that kind of a time scale. The big issue right now that I see, like, it, it's sad. I'm, I'm sad to say. I think, it's, I think it's clear the golden age of the internet has passed. And we could talk about technology and where it is another time, but the golden age of the te- of technology and quickly being able to find something that is over, you know, like the the main the main reason YouTube has such a, a 
stranglehold on where it is today is because at the time there were literally only two or three video websites. Um, if you were around back then, it was YouTube. Um, there was uh, Albino Black Sheep. There was E-Bombs World. And there may have been... It's like College Humor. College Humor. I, I think even College Humor was after YouTube almost. Um, but it was Albino Black Sheep and E-Bombs World. And there may have been... There was another one, Newgrounds. not send, not new. That wasn't really. That was like Flash stuff. That was like Flash. Some videos, but some things would go viral there. But essentially, what ended up happening was YouTube provided the most efficient and best way for creators to build a platform, essentially. And then what happened was, then they got a monopoly on everyone. Then they started paying everyone. And once they had full control of the video on the internet, then they started restricting everyone. And then that's when they started taking away privileges and, and people. Like, it wasn't even about breaking the law. It was just like, we don't like your content. And, and essentially, like, let's say, let's say they disagreed with 2% of people, right? And then 98% of people went like, well, it, that doesn't affect me, so whatever, right? But then more and more, that 98 then became 95, and then 94, and then 93. And eventually, right now we're in a situation where, unfortunately, YouTube's the best platform to grow still. And they paid, they they. They're, the rules they had place are very different from then than where they are now. If the rules they have in place now is what they had back then, they would not have grown to where they are. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Yeah, and, and you know, I think the kind of, I mean, you're right. I, I think we are seeing, we're absolutely seeing a um, kind of like a, a constriction now, where you know we went through this period of. Uh, 15 to 20 I mean, so you know 20 let's say let, let's just call it 20 years uh, of basically basically a free and open internet anything goes that what they call the wild west of the internet and you know and, and it was an amazing time you could find any kind of forbidden information yeah. forbidden factoids you could get any idea you wanted out there and now we're seeing a great kind of constriction where they're pulling it all back just like you said with youtube they're taking away what we had they're taking away the the freedom of speech they're taking away the the ability to even find information and, and that same thing is happening on google the same thing's happening everywhere and, and i think that's a part of this a part of the the What do you call it? The it, kind of like a, a, an element of that loss of human aut autonomy. That yeah, it, it's it's kind of, it's kind of a slightly separate issue, but I think it, it is related to that. Where this well, again, there was there was from I'd say let's say let's say from from the start of the internet till about I would go all the way up to two thousand thirteen fourteen. Like 2014, 15, that, that there was a solid 20 years of the internet was the Wild West where anything goes. And you weren't worried about something biting you in the back. And now everything you say, <laughs> like, can come back to haunt well, you. and that and that gets into that loss of aut autonomy. That it's not it's yeah. not just the you know we're losing the ability to find information, but it's that you know you better not say this certain thing, or you better say this other thing. You know, it's slow. that's just a part of it. But there are other ways that I think that technology is is going to take away human autonomy in a much bigger way, unless things change. We'll we'll see what happens. But but yeah, no, I, I share his concern. My kind of final thought on his book that I had written down here is that, again, I, I completely agree with his analysis about leftists. I agree with his concerns about technology. 
But yeah, he's right though. Like I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say he's right. Like technology is constantly progressing, and the better and the more things that come with technology, the more restrictions we get that come along with it, right? And we're already seeing that with <laughs> with AI. Every time there's a new AI model released or something, I like. It's like, oh, it's the AI that can do anything. You can ask it anything with an asterisk. And then it tells you what you can't yeah. do with it. And it's like, <laughs> well, then you can't really do anything if it's restricting me. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's restricting you, but that's that's for your own protection. It's like, well, it's not going to hurt me. Just just let it do something. Just, just let it go free range. But again, I, I wish we had, if ChatGPT came out in 2010, when the internet was free reign, it would be a game changer. And now it's basically a, a slightly more useful CNN. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'd be, I think we'd be <laughs> on a different timeline right now if we had chat GPT yeah. a decade ago. Uh, so, my, you know, my, my kind of final thoughts on the book, though, again, yeah, like I think you pro- like I probably, you know, agree with the whole analysis. However, my you know, I, I just think his prescription, his, his final, you know, his solution for the problem. I just think it's too hard of a sell. And, and you could even take the, the terrorism angle out of it and just say like, well, okay, well, what if there was a way to do this without, you know, if you could just flip a switch, you could vote for something and it would really happen. We'd really actually get what he wants if we all just voted for it. I just don't see anybody voluntarily signing up for it because we just because we have too many luxuries the, too many creature comforts that's There's why i no said it's one... like it's like all of technology like the internet cell phones tablets yeah. computers it's pandora's box i mean bear We're in mind this is gonna... not going out to a cabin and <laughs> hanging out with your smartphone and like you know bringing your laptop and, yeah, yeah. and then it's, coming home it's going, yeah it's not even like going there and then like all you okay you can go to the cabin but all your technology is disconnected. Yeah. And you bring no. food with you and you got your beer. It's like... No, he's saying <laughs> no technology, no no food. You have to hunt this is his 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 ideal is you you should hunt for your food. whether you're sick, whether you're feeling well, you wake up and you're sick, you have to go out and hunt or starve or have food stored. You know, that's the world he wants. And I just don't see anybody voluntarily signing up for that existence. The other thing, like medicine, oh, your kid is sick? Well, sorry, you know, we have to break a couple eggs to make this omelet. So, and he, Natural and selection. He, and he even does kind of <laughs> say that in the book. Like, well, yeah, I mean, your kid's going to have to die or your loved one may die. You know, we're not going to have medical care. And yeah, people are going to die. But isn't it better to kind of die? Kind of like to go out in a blaze of glory. Like, isn't it better for your kid to, you know, have like a good existence for like 12 years and really live and, you know, bite into to life or whatever for 12 years and then die rather than to live this unfulfilled existence where they never fulfilled the power process and you know lived until they're 80 so he actually he does kind of say that earlier in the book like yeah people are going to die because we're not going to have medicine and stuff but it's worth it and but again I, yeah. I just don't see anybody choosing to 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 go that far and there's there's too many luxuries yeah exactly. and, and 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 as much as we hate that the restrict there are restrictions in place but they're not at the point where they impede life that much and and that's also it's like ah i can live with it you know but i'm sure there's some people that are like oh these restrictions are crazy right and in 20 years that might be us where we say oh these restrictions are crazy and then someone's future someone's like eh it's not that bad but for us it'll it'll be crazy cuz we don't know what the future holds all i know is here's here's my lame prediction because it's obvious the prediction is technology is going to get better and we're going to be more restricted than ever <laughs> so let me ask you this <laughs> kind of a closing question here are we living in the world that he warned of and feared today right now in, in 2023 are we living is that world here no no it's it's still not there i because i think it's gonna it can still get 
a lot worse. But I think, again, it's stuff like, I think where the internet is is not something he predicted at all and he had any sense of coming, especially when you're living out in a cabin, right? Like, you know, <laughs> like imagine if he found out about the internet. He was like, oh, I could have just posted this on a message board. Right? Yeah. But, <laughs> like, I don't think he, he knew where the internet was going and where stuff like, like how he was 30 years away from stuff like ChatGPT or even um, MidJourney or any of that. Right? But I think the world that he fears could easily come mainly because of his prediction of where like of how much he he uh denigrates the left in this in his book so much yeah, yeah no, I, I, <laughs> so a I lot agree. of what he talks about it's like it's like i can see i got so a lot of his predictions i can definitely see because at the time you got to keep in mind like he doesn't say leftists will do this or leftists eventually are going to go after this and say this and do this. Like he's saying in his book, he says leftists are doing this and they are still doing this. Right. So um, I don't know. I don't think we're living his nightmare. I think there, there was a, 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 a fork in the road at one point and we took a, different path but we're we could still definitely be headed to the nightmare scenario yeah i i agree what I, about I you don't think, I, I don't think we're there yet today i do think we're on that path absolutely i, I am you know, in terms of the loss of human autonomy a complete autonomy in terms of the the left basically you know, subjugating and p potentially even exterminating everybody that they don't like. I mean, yeah, I, I, I do think that we're on that path. We're not there yet, but, you know, it, it could change. Uh, we'll see what happens well, in the stuff future. Like, again, stuff like the internet is almost an, at least it was pre pre-restrictions, but it is a bit of an equalizer, and it changes the game it, it so much. It does throw a huge monkey wrench, and you know, wild cards can come up that you never thought were possible. And, because and I feel that's part of what we're doing right here by you know discussing these ideas, spreading these ideas. We're yeah, helping because to propagate some when, something other than the the path that we're on, helping to kind of guide people and corral people off into to, to think about different ideas. To so yeah, no, that's. I, I totally agree with that. The The good thing about the internet is that it can help as a, as a I guess a, you could say a, a bit of a white pill. It is and can make a, a small mini revolution by causing zero violence, right? It can unite people. You can share ideas and you don't need to hurt anyone. Yeah. No, and, that's, and, that's, and I think, yeah. and again, uh, when he talked, when Ted Kaczynski in his books talks about revolutions and overthrowing, I'm pretty sure, like, he doesn't say explicitly, kill the president, kill the prime minister, kill, like, he, but he is inferring it. He is inferring you'll need to, like, overthrow and kill these politicians. But with the internet, I, I think if there is any real life revolution that were to happen it would be a quiet one where no one gets hurt and it's people coming together in harmony and without a single bullet being or gun being trigger being pulled yeah i think that's a really good point to leave off on i think that's a good closing good closing argument right there what do you think yeah, I think we can. Uh, I think that's good to leave it there. That's a wrap. All right. Well, I hope everybody who listened uh, got something out of this and enjoyed it. And we will be back very soon with more. Love you.